Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage David A. Steinberg and John Scully. I feel like this is my bar mitzvah, right? We've, you've got the you know, Eye of the Tiger playing. Well, I'm supposed to start by saying, live from New York, it's Zeta Live. <laughs> John, I can't even, like I look around, it's, it's somewhat overwhelming to see where we've come from, right? Yeah. So 16 years ago, we founded this business on the premise that marketing needed to be consolidated from yeah. multiple solutions into one. But there are very few humans on this planet who have seen more of what's happening next in technology. I'm supposed to talk about the iPhone, and I'm supposed to talk about the Macintosh. But to me, the most interesting was the Newton, which for those of us old enough to remember, you know, sort of the early stage future of technology. But when you think about how technology is gonna change the landscape, how does intelligence play into that the way you think about it? Well, I, I love that our theme is not artificial intelligence, it's intelligence, because one of the things which uh, you smartly did at Zeta uh, was you took real data, real-time data, and took it to scale, so we're actually doing what, trillions of digital signals? Trillions of signals. Yeah. And, on and uh, I, think, I think that's where, where the future is, being able to harness real in intelligence and being able to put it in the hands of CMOs uh, to be able to create campaigns that can really do something measurable, you know, like intent to purchase. Yeah. And as, as we like to say, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. Yeah. You know, obviously today is, and, and people have said to me on multiple occasions, why, you know, it's an interesting collection of speakers, right? We have actors, we have professors, we have business people, we have multiple CMOs from Fortune 500 companies all the way across. To me, this event is about thought leadership. It's not about an all-day ad for Zeta, because that, you know, listen, as much as you know, my mother might want to see that, I don't think anybody else would. Uh, as we think about sort of cultural thought and leadership, you did, you, you had the Macintosh, you had the iPhone. Like, how does artificial intelligence, do you think that becomes sort of the Gutenberg printing press and the internet and the telephone and AI, does, does it take its place there? Well, I have uh, some long history with artificial intelligence. Were you around for the Gutenberg printing press, John? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but uh, back in uh, 1986, uh, I was asked to join the advisory board of the MIT Media Lab. It had just been formed, and uh, Jerry Wiesner, and, and, uh, who had been the president of M MIT, uh, had set this up, and I was working with some of the professors there. One of them was Marvin Minsky, who was regarded as the father of yeah. artificial intelligence. And we didn't really know at that time. Marvin was conceptualizing what it could be. Uh, we had Seymour Papard, uh, was also one of the, the early people, uh, John McCarthy. These are all professors at uh, M MIT, and they were all working on artificial intelligence, and it wasn't clear back in the late 80s that there was gonna be a commercial future for artificial intelligence. I was- Still not. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I was um, working on a project at, at, at Apple, which was to convince people after Steve Jobs left that Apple was still gonna be able to do innovative things. And so uh, we created something that we called the Knowledge Navigator. And the Knowledge Navigator was a concept video. Um, you can actually go online to Google and look up Knowledge Navigator 1987, and you will see the first uh, virtual assistant ever uh, conceived. And, and the ideas all came out of MIT Media Lab. Uh, and what it did was it, it showed something that looked very much uh, different than Alexa or Siri, what you really saw was what's about to come from companies like Google, where we're moving into conversation. So ChatGPT4 gives us the ability to be able to do conversation as a way of showing the power of intelligence. So 
uh, it's, it's interesting how long it can take to go from a concept, it wasn't my idea, it was coming out of you know, brilliant people at, at uh, MIT Media Lab, but at Apple we showed a way to turn it into a, a, a product vision. And here we are, uh, you know, some almost 40 years later, and it's finally on the horizon to be coming out, and that's conversational intelligence. And sometimes technologies take that long. Yeah. They go from the lab all the way out, right? People forget that you know, DARPAnet you know, was created in the 1950s, yeah. right? and it took until really the World Wide Web to be created in the, the yeah, late that's, 90s. Yeah, that's true. Tim, Tim Berners-Lee uh, really introduced the World Wide Web um, in, well, he created it in 1991, but it commercialized it in 1994. Uh, but it goes all the way back to DARPA. Yeah, DARPAnet. Uh, which is where it started, yeah. Correct. Now, originally, it was meant to connect Air Force and Army bases yeah. on, a, on a closed intranet. Uh, we, I know we have some statistics on Zeta Live that we're supposed to put up at some point. <coughs> Maybe. All right. Mm -hmm. Fun facts. Well, it's good we're starting the day off properly. <laughs> There we go, all right. Well, we started this event three years ago at the height of COVID. My team said I was nuts. Do not do this in COVID. We had 40 people there. Uh, it was fun, but small. This year, we're over 650 in-person attendees. Uh, we're actually above what we're allowed to have, so we'll see how that works out. Over 25 countries. Uh, two World Cups, one by Brandy, our, our main speaker. We had dinner with her. She is really funny and fun. I'm looking forward to her talk. We have over 10,000 signed up people online. This is, by the way, the difference between like my marketing group and the way my head works. We have 66 non-Zeta speakers. We have 80 speakers if you include Zeta people. So I would have said 80, but no, in all seriousness. Oh, and there's my fantasy football score last week. <laughs> Sneaking that in, that is a Gerberism. For those of you who don't know, Steve Gerber, our president and chief operating officer, likes to sneak that stuff in. I will point out, I have been first, second, or third in our fantasy league at least pretty much every year since we founded it. And every year when we draft, they mock me, John. <laughs> they mock my draft picks because I don't do it the way they do. And then, Pop-up bagels for breakfast, Shake Shack for lunch. We're trying to really embrace our New Yorkness here. Yeah. And, but, but to finish up thinking of embracing New Yorkness, right? So marketing, in my opinion, has always been about creating connections. Yeah. How, you know, when you first came up with the Pepsi Challenge, which to me is probably the greatest connection experience in history, and today, we're trying to create a visceral response, that same type of connection digitally. Yeah. It's harder. How has that evolved in the one minute and 22 seconds we have left? <laughs> well, it was, it was pretty simple. When I was first appointed marketing VP of Pepsi-Cola, we were outsold by Coke. Uh, more than 10 to 1 in 50% of the country. So we we're really a regional brand. And so we had to figure out how to compete with the world's most valuable brand at that, that time. And we uh, were doing blind taste tests, and we discovered that Pepsi actually is perceived to taste better with Coke drinkers. Uh, obviously, as soon as you put the brand on there, you know, it, it can't win. So we came up with this idea of let's run taste tests. It happened that at that time, uh, the video camera had just been invented. And so we shot it all with handheld video cameras out in parking lots and in uh, you know, schools and colleges and places like that to give it uh, realism. And the, the result was uh, it drove Coca-Cola company crazy. They sued us. They, uh, <laughs> they even created a commercial with, with two chimpanzees taking a taste test. And all that did, people say, 
why is Coca-Cola, the world's most valuable brand, you know, taking this so seriously? So we got a lot of hope, help from our yeah, competitor. Sure. Well, and, and one of the things we're trying to do, last commercial for the moment at Zeta, is create those same visceral responses yeah. online by using data to figure out what do people intend to do next. I'm getting the red light. I'm just going to finish on one of my favorite stories. People say to me all the time, how did you and John meet? We've been partners now for 22 years through, I can't, I don't know how many companies. But one of the first experiences I ever had with John was we got to his office, which was at 90 Park Avenue, yeah. which is actually three blocks, four blocks from our now current corporate headquarters. And I was ushered in and I was super intimidated. This was John Scully, this is, you know, going on. And he was drinking a Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Really enjoy.